immersed in all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So their brains are totally wired differently. Yeah. Than... For better or worse. <laughs> yeah, for better or worse. Right now it's better, I think. Some of them like it. As, uh, so Peter and, and Todd make the comment that you don't love it. Demographic that, to be totally accurate in that? immersed in all yeah, of that. Yeah, that was right. Brains are... Yeah, so I'm curious about that. I'm curious about what it is that you don't love about it. Um, and I'm, because I have a, some thoughts on this in background, but I, I don't want to like put it out there prematurely. So I'm I, I, like, what is it that you that you don't like about this this platform of teaching? Or that you don't love? I, 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 I think what's happening with me is I'm just getting turned off to the professional profession overall. And that's definitely coloring my, my view. So um, it's, it's, I do have a lot of trouble with my students. They aren't, they aren't real good. <laughs> they're not very good at doing things. So it makes it harder. I think when they're in class, at least you can kind of, I don't know, influence them more than online. They just kind of like, they, I don't know, over the, over the internet, they just kind of look at you like whatever. And that's about it. So I don't know. It's it's not a real solid opinion. It's just mm -hmm. it's a shading of me getting older and wanting to retire. And I'm I'm not judging it. I think it's legit to say yeah. I don't know this or yeah. I, I had a lot more fun in the classroom with students. Okay. You know, you know spontaneous I, I, and all that. You know, for various reasons, when my kids were in school, we tried the online learning platforms that were available. While some of the kids that were in the program thrived, mine did not. I think it takes a certain a certain mindset in the child, or they're just not going to do it. You know, I, I was I was set. I've been you know teaching twenty two years when we sheltered in place, so I had my routine down. I had my shtick, and I had my you know uh, I'm an old school sage on the stage kind of um, teacher. And I just got totally sucker punched when I had to go online. And uh, when I, I had to start recording the videos, which I didn't start out doing, I had to do it for uh, legal liability issues. And when I would watch, I was, I was horrible. I, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I, it was awkward. I didn't like my voice. I didn't like the lighting. I didn't like my presentation. And it, it was just not the same as being there in person. And there are things that I did in the classroom that simply can't be replicated in this format. And so- Charisma, Charisma can't travel over the internet, I don't think as well, except for DDR, that's the exception. And you know what, and you know, uh, I've taken some cues from DDR uh, in doing this mm -hmm. MC thing. I've told my kids, I said, look, this is not the same as being there in person. And I, you know, um, there's something about online remote distance teaching learning that didn't sit well with me. There was something and I couldn't, it was totally ineffable. I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't articulate it. And it finally came to me. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm being straight up with my kids. I said, look, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, in this format, I'm, I'm not, I'm not teaching. I'm a moderator. I'm a facilitator. Um, and, and, and that's it. Uh, so, you know, I'm like, how am I going to do this? How do I do? Well, I, I'm going to do it like Peter Jennings. I'm going to do it like, you know, uh, Howard Stern. You just have to have a presence and you have to, you have to be able to hook the kids somehow. Yep. And, uh, like I, I, I'm constantly telling the kids is lacking as it is, this is better than nothing. So, uh, and, and I've, I've also, I've also told them that, um, you know, we're not, nobody's going back to the classroom this year. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our four-year-old, she'll go back to school when I'm reasonably satisfied that everybody in this country has been vaccinated with a vaccine that works. Um, and, and until that happens, you know, uh, there's, there's no way anybody's going to go back this year. Here in the United States, anyway. Yeah. Talk yeah, Todd, we, we're having exactly, we, we've had brief discussions online. We're having exactly the same uh, issue in the UK. Uh, you no, know, I, 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 I teach in a community college and I'm going through exactly the same process. 
Oh. And it's 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 quite scary. But can I can I can I say that you undersell yourself? Um, because your intonation and you, you, how you come across online is is you've got this chocolatey, velvety uh, voice that comes across extremely well. So don't undersell uh, undersell yourself mm-hmm. on that front. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. Exactly what I was going to say for both Todd and Peter. I think you are selling yourself short on your your ability to command a space. When you're when I what I hear from from both of you is a, a, a sense that you're not commanding the the classroom space in the same way that you used to when you were in person, and of course it's different. It's not the same, but that doesn't mean that it's less than. It doesn't mean that there's not new opportunities that you have that you didn't have in the physical space, and and your presentation your presence feels like spot on you know there's no question that both of you could command an online space filled with kids and 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 have an educational value to them um it is it is a new skill though and it's it's quite uh yeah it, well, and I, I, I emphasize that to my kids. First of all, uh, I would say that 50% of my presentation now is uh, social emotional learning, just trying to check in with the kids and see how they're doing. Uh, I also tell them that, um, you know, video conferencing, uh, that's a thing now, and, and, and it's not going away. Uh, this is going to be embedded into our lives the same way email was. They knew uh, already. Just <laughs> You know we're we're evolving, and uh, I you know and I I tell the kids I say look this is a place we're not only talking about geography physical geography cultural geography that sort of stuff, but this is a place where I want the kids to be comfortable and 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 hone and up their online video presence skills, because some people are going to do it better than others, and and um, it's a skill set and it's going to be in demand. And I'm I'm trying to get them to be more interactive. I'm I'm just thankful that I've got them all up online and they're on video and I can see their faces. One thing I'm noticing with the kids, like let's say middle school or even elementary, is that like what you said, Todd, when they have issues, you are not there to physically sit next to them and say, Hey, and you see their frustration, I don't want to do it. And by the end of like maybe 20 minutes after you said the problem. You see a couple of guys who did nothing about it, but you are not there to kind of look and say, hey, let me stop with the other ones who are doing on their own. Let me focus on these two who are kind of behind and frustrated with that. That's the only bad I'm putting for at least younger kids, because in college or high school, it's like you just talk for an hour. They take their notes and they go to the next day. They kind of don't need you much. So how would you just like take this on for a second. If you were back in a physical space again, and you noticed this kind of a problem, what what would you typically do? Like, right, David suggests that you sort of go sit by, go sit next to them and maybe take them aside and let the people who are more self-directed um, carry on while you while you spend some time with them. You know, we're, we're I teach at Saratoga High School. I'll throw that out there. In I know Silicon Valley and you know our parent community are high powered postgraduate it's a high academic stress pressure cooker I've been there for 23 years and for 23 years we've been talking about and grappling with stress uh, we have our own psych ward on campus it's called Cassie um, where kids can go uh, for you know, they've got these, these issues. And, um, you know, part of the social emotional learning part of this is when I'm talking to the kids, the old way of testing and quizzing and doing assessments, you can't do that online. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, their academic load and their pressure has decreased. I know I pulled them on this and, and, uh, the academic pressure is just as prevalent at the middle school because my daughter went through that middle school. Um, and they, 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 virtually all of them say that it's, it's better. 
the academic stress, the pressures, you know, and there's a feature on Zoom. We, this, the district bought a license for this Zoom Pro and there's a polling feature where you can put together a, a poll. And I like that because it's not called a test. It's not called a quiz. When I say test or quiz to these kids, they have a, they have a physiological reaction. I mean, their, their chest tightens, their pupils dilate, they, their palms get sweaty. And so this is a poll. Um, I asked, I give them a, a chapter reading, chapter two, geography. And then I put together 10 questions. It only allows you 10 questions. And then I give them the poll. They answer the 10 questions, they submit it. And then I can share the results of that poll with them. So it, it's like, you know, uh, that sphere of the earth, which consists of all the, you know, oceans, seas, rivers, and they'll say hydrosphere, 97% of the kids get that. And they can see that for each of the questions. Now, once they submit it, there are 10 questions. I'm gonna give them 10 points. That's their exit ticket. I don't care how many they got right or wrong. They're gonna get 10 points. So they get 100%, so they're getting an A. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to alleviate that stress and anxiety. And, and, and just give them, you know, 40 minutes of kind of a current events, check in, how you doing? Um, so in the physical classroom, if I, if I saw something that set me off, I, I'd, I'd, I'd go to the counselor and say, hey, somebody needs to check in with this kid. In this environment, it, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to do. But, you know, just, um, and I, I was just telling him yesterday, that I think that there are people in my profession, in our district, the powers that be, they have a mindset that when this is all over, when everybody's vaccinated, that we're going to go right back to the old way, the old normal, the way we were doing things. They're going to go right back to the same bell schedule, the same. And I'm like, I don't think that's at going to our school too. It's like, Oh, in spring, we'll just be all back to fully in class. And it's like, you guys are nuts. You know what? Don't and don't plan on that because you'll be really disappointed. Well, I'll tell you. If they and they're going to try and do this. And what they're going to find is that going back to the old way is going to be more disruptive. More disruptive. Than it was going to shelter in place in the first place. Because everybody's routine, everybody's time management has been totally upended. You know, instead of working a 12 hour workday on the old schedule, I'm, I'm putting in six now. And I'm thinking, you know, if, if I have to go back to the old, you know, the old normal was killing us. And it wasn't normal, it wasn't healthy. Uh, and, and I think what they're gonna find, it was when they try to go back to that, that evolution doesn't go in reverse, it only goes forward. And, and we're evolving and um, you, you can't reverse that evolutionary process. Like I said, you know, this video conferencing format here, this is a, it, this is, this is a forever thing. This is with us now. Um, and um, it, it's, it's just a, a wacky world we live in. But even before shelter in place, um, the, um, the educational uh, environments were an anachronism already. Yeah. Like the, the kind of behavior that you have show up in the morning and sit in a classroom or change classrooms throughout the day with a series of, of you know, lessons and tests did not map to any other behavior outside of the school. Not the way the kids act with each other. That's not the way that the parents act at work. And so now we're forced into a new format. I mean, the reason why I, I sort of wanted to, to see if we could pursue this line of question, which, by the way, I am going to segue into pipes in just a moment. <laughs> just I'm doing that right now. You're here. You see. There on YouTube go, oh, what, what, what group did we stumble into here? <laughs> so uh, I... Well, just context. And, you know, I'm biased. I have a point of view of this because we've been using this. This is what I do for a living. This is the format that we use and we've been using for 10 years. And it's a it's an educational company that I run, essentially. And 
I'd love to, I'd hate to lose great teachers like Todd and Peter from the educational profession. I, I think that even when you're at the end of your sort of professional career, there's so much that you can contribute to the next generation of teachers and to leave behind as a legacy to your students and whatnot. I, I hate to lose you. So, you know, I, I want to jump in and go, okay, so these are the things that you hate about or that you don't love about it. It's legit. Like, don't love it. Don't try to change your mind. But there are things that if I could sprinkle some pixie dust on you, you would find that you would love. There's opportunities here in this format that did not exist in the old anachronistic platform. And, you know, decision about whether you want to put in, you know, to, to make a change, to sort of re reinvent your, your method of teaching, um, which again, nobody gets to judge. That's, that's yours. And dudes, you've got so much left to give. You've got so much more to give. Like I'd hate to see you go away. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> hey, David, let, let, let me enter, let me inject this. I taught for many years uh, and I've taught everything from preschool to graduate engineers and both ends of that spectrum are somewhat similar. So yeah. <laughs> the, the paradigm we use to drive public schools is so flawed that it materially damages many of our students for their entire life. I ran to this when I left education and went to work in industry. I found people, I was hiring people. They were, they were brilliant people. These people were typically engineers, computer scientists or other types of engineers. And their model was, I do this for a period of time and then I get a promotion and then I get a promotion and then I get a promotion. And this was basically the model that had gone from grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five. And they didn't have any concept of plateau where you build skills to a point you're competent and now you plateaued. And it's not a bad thing. Because on the plateau, you build the skills for what your next step is. They just had a mentality that if I do this long enough, I'm supposed to be rewarded just for, for being present. Um, and and I, I've seen this somewhat with my, with my own children who went through public schools. And, and I've maintained for years, and I maintained this back when I taught in public schools, that our paradigm is damaging us because we're, we're damaging our students. We seldom focus on content mastery, which is what Todd was talking about earlier, where I give you a unit of work, I give you an assessment instrument that tells us how well you did. When I taught in university level at the University of Richmond back in Virginia, we had a test in my class every week. It always dealt with a bounded domain of information, which was just the material from the previous week. And, and my students at first despised this and they hated it, they, they feared it. But then they realized that this was a bounded amount of material. And even this was an information systems class, which was foreign to most of them. Even though it's bounded amount of information, bounded foreign information, it's a bounded domain and they could master that within the week. And so almost universally, they scored well on these tests and we moved on. Periodically, they didn't. And of course, the rule I had just for this was we throw away your two low scores across the semester because we've got 15 weeks, we're going to do a bunch of these. But if the entire class scored poorly, that was not their issue. That was mine. And I would throw the whole set away and we would back up and redo that material. Because like most classes, there's content that builds week on week and concept on concept. And if you miss a concept right here at this point, it creates a, a shadow of ignorance that casts out into everything that follows. And it's critically important to erase that. And you so know, anyway, I will shut up, but that, that's my perspective uh, from years of doing this crap. I just like that you said bounded domain. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. You that know, was mathy. Uh, I like that. The, um, just a, you know, the model that we were using going into the third decade of the 21st century it's a 20th century model. I mean, the reason we have June, July, and August off is so the kids can go home and pick the crops and harvest, right? I mean, and, you know, we've had this mandate 
at least in California, where we have to have 64,800 minutes, instructional minutes in the classroom. You know, we used to have 95 minute rolling block classes. And, you know, that 64,800 is such a bullshit, arbitrary number. Um, certainly in, you know, like I said, we're, you know, it's 2020, way into the 21st century. Certainly we can realize some type of, uh, efficiencies where we can deliver relevant content in, in, in less time or different ways. So I, like I said, you know, I mean, I mean, all the, the teachers are teaching a, 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 on average 40 minutes. That's what I'm doing because zoom fatigue is real. Um, and, and to try and go back to that physical brick and mortar 90 minute block. I, I think that's going to be difficult for everybody, kids, teachers, everybody. Yeah, I think we're looking at a new landscape here. I like what um, John was saying about the plateau. I think there's a wonderful, really small readable book by George Leonard called Master. In, I don't know if that's John. Where I, that's where I stole that from, by the way. Yes. So he says, learn to love the plateau. We, we have, yeah. like, coming from the world of sports, this, the, the, the term plateau is always like a terrible thing. I've plateaued, I get, you know, like, ah, <laughs> help me get off the plateau. And George Leonard says, no, you've got to learn to love the plateau. That's where all the real stuff happens. All right, listen, I just got to, first of all, thank you, gentlemen, for participating in, in that. And I don't mean to say that that's not appropriate in our club here, the, the, the club, the group, is about what's of interest to any and all of us. So obviously this is interesting and thanks for participating and we can come back around to it. I do want to um, make sure that everybody who came for pipe stuff gets pipe stuff. So let me let me jump into that and say, um, you know, good afternoon and welcome to, the, to today's meeting of the Virtual Pipe Club. Um, and um, I, you, some of you will notice I put you on mute, and that's only, 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 only to keep the um, the cameras from jumping around when um, your speaking comes through or something like that. Um, and you can put yourself back on the microphone anytime you want to. Don't, don't. That's not a not a manipulative thing here. Um, also, we have something that our kids don't have to reduce stress, and that's these things. <laughs> um, I would not recommend to children, by the way, I want to make very clear to everybody who might be watching or, or mistaken uh, a message there that uh, tobacco in any of its forms is a, an adult kind of choice to make. And um, when kids get um, attracted to tobacco, I'm not sure that they're ready to make that choice with their, with their brains the way they are. And so I want to make sure that from as a personal point of view, and I think representing a, you know, something that's, that's being broadcast out on YouTube and whatever, that we, we say that, that tobacco is not recommended for kids, but for adults, for the teachers, we get a chance to um, sit back, hang out in a group like this, um, light up a pipe, enjoy ourselves, take a moment to relax, reflect, and I, for one, am really grateful for that. Um, we've got a topic for the day, but before we jump into the topic, I thought maybe we could spend a little time talking about what you're smoking and what you're smoking it in and all that kind of good stuff that we like to do. Uh, this is what I, I uh, call the humble brag section of the, uh, of the club. So, John Torfey, what are you smoking today, brother? You have to turn your own mic back on, but... So today I'm smoking uh, my 7LE320. Um, this is one I bought from the Pipe Nook. It was uh, uh, one of those uh, discontinued uh, number three series. It was unfinished. I finished it and been smoking it for a while now, and it's starting to darken up. And what I'm smoking in it is I'm smoking uh, Silum's Black, uh, which I just bought. And if you saw the post that I put up there, I guess it's now under John Aylesbury's brand. Um, but it tastes the same as the Silum's Black, so but that's what I've got going. How strong is that? Is that a strong? It's 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 um not it's it's, it's a mild tobacco. Um, it's it's a 
type of an aromatic, but I'm really not getting a lot of flavors in it. I mean, it's it's very when you smell it, the tin note is very very smoky. I mean, it's like it's like you're smelling a barbecue. I mean, it's very smoky, but it, I'm not getting that across smoking it. Um, but it's it's a pleasurable smoke. Awesome. Love the pipe, by the way. I was just, I haven't smoked in my 320s all summer long. I've kind of been like, I look at them. I, anybody else do this? Have some 320s or some big authors and you look at them and go, I don't know, it's too hot. <laughs> that's what that's what goes through my mind. So I'm, I'm waiting for winter time and I'm going to bust them out. Um, awesome. Uh, David, David Beshoff has got rum and maple. David, uh, David's all bundled up. I saw him a minute ago um, out there in the cold because it's, because it's winter in South Africa. What do you got there, brother? Let me, let me bring out your video. Show, show the pipe again, would you? Rum and maple. There we go. That's gorgeous. By the way, for those of you who maybe uh, didn't know or over there on, on YouTube, why this is such a big deal? Because David's in South Africa and they haven't had no tobacco for six months. They have wow. like <laughs> nothing, no ability to buy online, can't go out. It's been, what, what's Dutch for, or what's, what's Afrikaans for forbidden? Verboten. I don't know. I, I, that's what I was going to guess, but I'd be wrong for sure. <laughs> I have a friend I want to send tobacco to in South Africa, and I can't. <laughs> but it's like, nope. Bud says, I'm never moving to South Africa. Just, just on the off chance that it may happen again. I'm not. <laughs> hey, I'm Bud, uh, I got to say, I was surfing around on Brian Levine's Facebook I saw that pipe that you refurbished for him, the estate. Uh, that was beautiful. That that wasn't me, I don't think. That wasn't you? No. No, I don't think so. Interesting. Maybe it was a different bud. I just that saw a bud. Are you friends with him on Facebook? Uh, Brian, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Apparently, he's running around telling everybody that you're a great pipe restorer, so just watch out. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless, you know what, at least I didn't do one for him. I don't know. Do you, might, do I you, might have you restored rest something for myself that, you know. Do you restore pipes, refurbish them? Uh, no, not. Wow. Not general, no. Just for myself. That's, you know, I, 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 that is what I call, and I've, I've told people this, that I have these episodes, I, I call it Zoom Room Vertigo <laughs> when I'm teaching. That kind of stuff happens, and it, it totally throws you off. Whoa. COVID Alzheimer's. <laughs> well, Todd, since you're, uh, since you're up, what are you smoking today, buddy? You know, uh, we were um, last week with Russ. He made the comment, nothing smokes like McClellan, Virginia's, which, so yeah, I went back and um, I went to my closet and I got out the, um, some of the Virginia Flake anniversary. And, um, you know, this, this jar was full four years ago. I, tr I try not to smoke it because I've only got like nine, I've got three tins, so I've got 900 grams left, plus what's in the jar. And, you know, if, if it's three grams per bowl, I want to stretch this out. Maybe I've got 300 bowls left and, you know, I got to stretch that out over the next 20 years. Um, but that's what I'm, I'm smoking and it's delicious and I'm doing it in a Michael Fors German clay. Can't really, nice. but, yeah. yeah. And I want to back up what Russ said. Nothing like McClellan, Virginia's. I, when I open it up, the, tin, the ketchup, I love that smell. It goes right to my brain. It's like there's nothing else that smells like that. I'm happy. I'll shut up now. Awesome. 
Awesome. Um, guys over there on uh, YouTube, uh, you could join in with this as well. What are you smoking? What are you smoking it in? Um, Todd A, another Todd over there. Um, there's nothing right now. And so I just have a little tear going down my face for not smoking anything right now. Um, but yeah, uh, WKR Piper is over there and saying um, hello to everybody. Uh, what are you smoking over there, brother? Um, Phil, Phil Orr, yes. What uh, what have you got, sir? You're muted, Phil. He's muted. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the the postman's been good to me this week again. I've had another shipment. Um, so, I in my near up tonight, I have some black gold maple. It's it's the the battle of the aromatics for me tonight. So it's the USA in in the Danish, and for later I, I invested in a Falcon, um, and it has uh, the exclusive uh, black cherry from from Gowith in it. Uh, so it's it's the US and uh, Denmark versus the UK on the aromatic front. There is a wee story behind this pipe. I bought this for a reason this this week, in that uh, David Bryant. I'm a I'm a lawn bowler, so I play lawn bowls, and uh, David Bryant was uh, a world famous 70s and 80s world champion bowler. Had passed away this week, and always had a falcon in his mouth when he was bowling. Uh, he was never without it. So that's a wee tip of the hat to him. That's wonderful. Sunbear asked uh, was talked about that this week, kind of like trying to get some feedback on Falcons. What would you say to him? Mm. I, I, this, this is going to be the first light up. I haven't, uh, yeah, uh, my first impression, um, it's fairly basic. It only cost about a uh, uh, 30 pounds, uh, uh, UK pounds. I don't know, what's that, 35 bucks, something like that. It's very light. It's got quite a big ball in it, this, and obviously the balls are interchangeable, but it's, it's what I didn't expect is that it's a sitter. It sits well on the table as well, so I'll 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 give him some feedback once I've once I've got it fired up. I got a funny story about falcons. Nothing related. The first time I ever saw one, I was in uh, Portugal on the beach, and I saw like a guy at the stop sign, kind of holding it, waiting, I guess, for his wife. A typical hairy guy, back, all body, with his speedos, smoking a falcon. And that was my first impression of a falcon. So it's kind of, I don't <laughs> get one of those. It was like a scary, uh, I guess not. Were you scarred? The missing that? link. <laughs> <laughs> my first time ever on a cruise ship, which was, <laughs> but the, I went to the, the opening night greeting. I don't know if anybody has ever been on a cruise ship. And so I've got the comedian on board and he says, I don't know where he is. But somewhere on this ship is a 300-pound man in a Speedo. And I was like, sure enough, <laughs> sure enough. And it scarred me for life. So I'm still in therapy about that one. So, David, I could imagine. <laughs> guys, guys, I, I, I still swim in Speedos. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Good on you, Phil. Um, I almost I... quit smoking because of that. <laughs> I, I bow in respect to the gentleman who can do that because I don't think that's in my <laughs> in my comfort zone. Uh, super. Um, who else? <laughs> David says it's too cold to swim here in South Africa. Um, Stephen, what are you smoking there, brother? Um, I just got in a couple of tobaccos. The other day, St. Bruno, which I'm smoking in this Benway. And then I got, I wanted to try some, one of the guys said some good stuff about this Amphora Kentucky. It's really good. I we mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I'm so, sorry? That I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago that it was oh, okay. good. Yeah. Well, it must have stuck with me. Very good stuff. Love that Ben Wade, by the way. That's gorgeous. Yeah, this is the other. Today is a freehand day. This is a Nording. I got this. Well, I guess it's 
50 years old. So is the Ben Wade, as a matter of fact. I got them both around the same time. I, I was interested in freehands because I thought, well, these are great. Nobody else has anything like this. Um, I'll bet you there's a, I'll bet you, I'll bet you uh, Dimitri's got a couple of free hands in his pocket there. Dimitri's though, he's, um, and Uka. I eat on a couple of weeks ago with a gigantic water pipe. It looks like Dimitri's got his own today. Well, uh, it's, uh, like very simple, uh, mass produced, uh, Lebanese hookah, also known as Nargile or Kalyan. <laughs> and I'm smoking uh, one of my blends. Uh, well, actually, one of the advantages of uh, any water pipe, uh, if you have tobacco which smokes too hot or has a tongue bite, if you smoke it in a water pipe, you never get tongue bite, even if you try, no matter how hard you push it. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. So well, the smoke that, basically uh, filters through the water. It cools completely, <laughs> and uh, nothing harsh comes through. Yeah. Well, I remember that from college, and I'm not yeah, in high school too. Never got tongue bite from my bong. And I'm taking one of my own blends. It's uh, a blend of uh, Oriental tobaccos. Um, I see a couple of new faces. Uh, Ian, I w just wanted to uh, say hello. I um, love it when I when I meet somebody new. Um, jump in and share what you what you got going on there. Tell, uh, say hello. Uh, hi, I've got a um, Savinelli, um, what I would call a library pipe, but you probably call it a church warden. Um, and I've got McBaron's Scottish blend in it which I bought in Germany because tobacco is too expensive in the UK. So when I go to Europe, I get a whole, I get a whole kilo and lug it back. Because it's like, it's about 40% of the price it is in or less. So, because we got so much duty on tobacco. This is, it's insane, you know, and they didn't used to be so hard on pipe tobaccos, but they've been a few years back now. They were shoving it up all the time, you know, so it's a bit, bit naughty. But my favourite tobacco, interestingly enough, is from Vermont, which I go to occasionally, called Ethan Allen, who I believe was a, a famous resistance fighter against um, the Redcoats. So there you go. Um, how often do you... Where uh, in the UK are you? I'm about half an hour from Heathrow Airport, which is a, a northwest london but greater london's you know greater london's got about i don't know 14 million inhabitants so i'm theoretically it's called middlesex but it's typically english middlesex sort of doesn't exist <laughs> it's, it's weird it, you know there's no such place really but you put it on your address it's i can't say it better than <laughs> crazy you know so yeah, I'm about half an hour from Heathrow, which is pretty useful because I'm a musician, so I fly a lot around, you know. Um, not at the moment. Well, not till October. I'm playing in Denmark, so hopefully, because you know, don't know what happens. They might suddenly. Although I wouldn't care if they said you got to stay and you know, be under your lockup. It would suit me. I couldn't care less where I live, really. You know. Because my money all comes through the internet, so it doesn't matter where I am, and also got my phone with me, you know. Ian, what do you play, brother? Um, well, I'm I'm a singer, and, and I write all the songs, and I just whenever I play live, I just ask a few people; they're happy because they get money. So I always have a different band, really. So it's just me, you know. It's like anything else. If you ain't on YouTube, you don't exist. So you got to be Instagram, <laughs> YouTube, all the rest of it, you know. I'm going to look for you. Yes, absolutely. Do sort of folk music. Well, it's the nearest thing I would say is a little bit like English folk music, which you may not have heard because Scottish and Irish folk music are quite famous, but English is not quite so famous. Although I think the Scots and the, maybe the Irish don't have many songs. They have tunes, but not so many 
lyrics. We were lucky uh, because we had lots of people who collected our songs, like thousands and thousands and thousands. Whereas if you go to Germany, they just don't, no one bothered, you know? It's sort of sad when you think about it, because once it's gone, it's gone forever, you know? There's a lot of American songs and a lot of them are the same. I know you sing things like Froggy Went to Court, but you have different lyrics, which is amusing. Because I sing a few American songs. Um, yeah. Yeah, Froggy Went to Court because of Bob Dylan. You know, that's... Right. Oh, yeah, he came to England and nicked a load of songs from a famous folk singer over here. And he didn't really credit him, so it's a bit of a sore point amongst folkies. <laughs> Actually, there's a good book about this called Singing from the Floor, I think, and it covers all the... So a very interesting history about where he's included in it, but mainly it's about, because it, what they used to do, these people would like play in Glasgow on Saturday, they'd play in the other end of England, 800 miles away on the Sunday, and on Monday they had to go back up to Wales or something, because that's because they couldn't hear you know, just different gigs. And they all met on the motorway in different sort of um, motorway, um, oh, you call it a freeway, I think. I know you have... Because someone it. earlier said a public school and I had to think because in England, a public school is a private school, which is another sort of weird thing. <laughs> what can I say? You don't do an Anagata DeVita cover, do you? <laughs> no, I don't, but it would be an idea, I think. Any Jeff Rotal? He is now. Check with him on Monday. So <laughs> we, we need to do an Anagata DeVita sing along here. <laughs> <laughs> And, I'll do um, the, the drum. <laughs> I got cowbell. the drum right behind me. Well, or cowbell. Right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the Gada the full version with that uh, drum solo is absolutely beautiful. You know, actually, when they released it on single, they had to cut it down because uh, they cut down that uh, drum solo because song was too long for a single. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad to be here. Glad to see everybody. I think we do need to to bring some some music to our uh, to our gatherings. That would be on all all seriousness. I think that'd be awesome. Well, I've I've got about 800 record albums, so I can help you out there. That's see, everybody's got something to contribute. Lowell, what are you smoking today, sir? I got a Jacopo here, an old orange dot Jacopo. Wait a minute, let me get it get it up here. Love the silver. That's beautiful. That's yes, a big hunk of silver. It is uh, silver, right? Yeah, I was trying to save it for my 50th year of my mom that I broke into it a little soon. I'm a <laughs> current, currently in Arkansas from St. Louis. I'm a founding member of the St. Louis Pipe Club. We're going on our 34th show this year, if we have it. And we're still planning on it in February. And I'm smoking some autumn evening. That's my that's my go-to blend from Cornell and Deal. Well, Lowell, welcome. I'm so glad that you came and joined us. It's wonderful. Please Thank you. Anytime. It's, it's, it's great. That's a great this looking pipe, Lowell. I love, I love the you. silver spigot. Yeah. We'll set it up there again. That's really nice. Yeah. And I've been smoking pipe for 50 years. This year on my birthday, it'll be 50 years. Got my first pipe on my 17th birthday for two bucks with a pouch of tobacco. <laughs> do you, do you, do you, do pipe do you still have the pipe? Huh? Yeah, I got it. It's in the drawer here. It's broke right now. But let me dig it out of here. Did you buy any pipes from the Joe's Pipe Shop downtown St. Louis? No, I did not. I was still a little young back then. My dad took me in there a couple of times. And there was uh, Moss and Lowenhoff, too. That was another pipe shop. He, yeah. he bought my first real good pipe there. I don't know where that one is. That's where I got my on first my, one. That was my 17th birthday. Well, here's half of it. I don't know where the stem went. <laughs> it's a Willard. <laughs> So let me okay. quick uh, jump in. So I'm smoking some uh, HH uh, um, um, Virginia from McBaron, and I'm in the middle of my break-in process. This is my brand new Suge pipe. I'm very happy. So it's a very nice. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. 
So yeah, I like that. This is my one and only Japanese pipe, and so I'm pretty much done with my Japanese collection. I have uh, two Japanese lighter and a Japanese tamper. So what I missed all the time was a Japanese pipe. So I'm very happy. <laughs> right. I saw that on Facebook this morning. Yeah, I missed that. Oh, that those sugis are so just exquisite. You know, just have that that sort of clean yet organic kind of look to it. it, it that's beautiful. Yeah, very nice. And knowing the Japanese, it'll be a good piece of engineering as well. Um, who am I forgetting here? I'm, um, I know I haven't, haven't uh, included everybody. Well, David, what are you smoking? I guess in honor of Stephen, I'm getting a free hand today, the Northern. Can I smoke a sunbear? Nah, I ran out of sunbear now. <laughs> <laughs> Just so that everybody gets the joke, David did get 37 uh, tins of uh, sunbear to. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I get 19. <laughs> He has one third of the uh, of the first run of uh, Sunbear. Say hi, Gabby. Yeah. <laughs> this is my companion. Glenn, what do you got going on down there? I'm smoking um, uh, Benjamin Hartwell Evening Stroll. It's, uh, I think about twenty years old. Uh, still remarkably, you know, fresh and uh, tastes great. And it's in my 50-year-old uh, Criswell bamboo. Oh. It's a little small, but it's uh, nice for a short smoke. Did you say 50 years old? Yes. Oh, man. You ever tried the uh, Hartwell's Chesden mixture? Yes. I love that. <laughs> that reminds me. I haven't had any for a while. I better order some. <laughs> if I can find it. It's kind of hard to find too, but it's good stuff. I was smoking the same one last week. I'm going to um, I'm going to open up a new uh, line of conversation. If that's all right with you guys. Um, Oliver had a terrific um, suggestion during the week there when we were chatting about. Um, uh, this week's meeting and, and topic about um, pipe care, uh, or actually just in a, a larger kind of subject matter about all of the stuff that we have, the paraphernalia, the, the um, accessories that we have to, to pipes and pipes. And I thought, well, one of the first things that this refers to is about how we, we take care of our pipes. Um, you know, what, what we used to call in the Navy, you know, prevent, plan preventive maintenance, right? So how do we, uh, how do we clean them? How do we, well, I'm not even going to list the things because I, I think I want to bring it out in the group there if we get a chance to do that. So um, I'd love to hear from uh, everybody who wants to contribute. Like what, what's your, starting off with after today, when our session's over and you're you're going to go back inside, you put your pipe down. Do you immediately clean it? You put it aside. Do you like not clean it at all and say, "Well, sometime yep. fall, I'm going to do a whole cleaning for the whole rack." Like, um, I, stick, I stick a pipe cleaner in one way, then turn it around, stick it in the other way to get the rest, and I just set it aside. I used to leave a pipe cleaner in my pipes after every smoke, but I got lazy. And I'm suffering the consequences now. I'm here cleaning my K Woody Bulldog, and it's nasty. Sometimes they get stuck, though, <laughs> when you leave them in. You go to pull it out, you can't get the damn thing out. Well, and I understand yeah. why this smoke was a little bit uh, sour. The uh, <laughs> really needed to be clean. But on a positive note, I did get that PS41 to burn in this thing. <laughs> I just got done cleaning my. My pipes the other day took me a week. Well, all I only together. have a handful, so it's probably going to take me. I'll probably be done cleaning them all by the end of the meeting. I got about 100. 
I don't smoke enough older, for that many. <laughs> I have a set of older pipes that I call my work pipes. Most of them are they aren't expensive things. They may be basket pipes that I've picked up over the years. Some of them I've had for 30, 40 years. And lately, I've, I've, I found them. I've got a, you know one of those reamers you use. It's got a little handle on it, and you twist it and grind it and clean it out. But, but I found that the bowls were getting conical. Uh, I was I was having trouble getting down in it, so I, I went to look, see what I had that would help me write these things out. I looked at twist drill bits, but I, I was worried about those because they're they're designed to grab material and pull themselves in, and I could just see one of those coming right out the bottom of the of the barrel. But I stumbled across a three eighths inch masonry pipe bit, uh, pipe uh, drill bit. Though that has like a spade end on it. That's just the right size. Yeah. So you chuck, chuck that thing in a variable speed drill and you have the ability to control both the pressure and the speed. And it, I found that in, in my work pipes, the ones that were in the worst shape, it did an excellent job of reaming those puppies out and reaming it even down to the bottom because that bit, the spade on it is kind of sort of shovel shaped. It doesn't have a sharp cutting point in it. I, I don't know that I'd recommend this to everybody, or I don't know that I'd use this on my Ben Wades or Nordings, uh, but it, on the work pipes, of which I have three, it just did the best job of cleaning those puppies out, and now they smoke <laughs> longer than they have for years. So what I'm doing after smoking my pipe, I use a pick and loosen up the, uh, the ash and let it sit for a while so the, the ash uh, it's very helpful to suck all the moisture out of the wood, so it's it's helpful. So I'm I'm not not uh, put it away. So just then. Uh, I'm curious you know, about I, uh, one of the I, things that I'm looking at is is a what I would call a ritual around it, like every how many of you are that disciplined like i've got like every time i smoke a pipe i'm and the reason why i ask this is a lot of times i read posts or books or magazine articles about pipes and it seems like the people who are writing are a bit more disciplined than i am <laughs> and so they they describe this sort of like you know, regular i'm gonna when every time i put the pipe down i'm gonna do this and then i do that how many of you have one of those kind of rituals or is it just like ah, i don't care that much i do it every time i've got a couple um I, and i just sweetened all my briars last night um and I, I i sweeten using um wild turkey 101 uh and last night i actually used the wild turkey 101 rye for a change uh and i I, I sweeten them probably four times a year and I just do them all at once. It, it's very therapeutic, it's kind of a Zen thing. Um, once a year, I polish the briars. For, um, for my smooth briars, I, I use the uh, Paragon wax. And for the rusticated, I use the, the Halcyon 2. And I need a buffer and I don't know what what brand what style I, I need some advice on that because this is the buffer I've been using you know my toothbrush and that that's that's I, I need a, a better buffer for that what power tools do you have available I'm sorry what was that what power tools do you have available I don't I don't I don't have any I don't even have like a variable speed drill I'm uh, my old Makita battery powered thing that just died uh, well what i use is and i use it on my lathe obviously because i have a lathe to make pipes but uh through vermont freehand you can get uh arbors and buffing wheels fairly cheap yeah uh, really vermont uh, but you've got to have something to put them on it's vermontfreehand.com yeah vermont freehand's a great place to get um tools and and um equipment and, and things like you know what terry was saying with the buffing wheels i get a lot most of mine from there as well todd i'll tell you what i did i went to a garage sale and i bought an old um 
grinding wheel, which is not what you're supposed to use, but because it's not variable speed, but I, I put um, a variable speed switch on it. And um, it, you know, as long as you're careful, it won't gouge the material at all. It's exactly what you need. And it cost me 25 bucks. So go on Amazon to get a, um, a, a buffing, you know, a dual side of buffing wheel and it might cost you a hundred bucks, which is still like whatever, but I'm not that, I'm not that good at anything, you know, in terms of handyman stuff. So to spend $25 on a, on a, the grinding wheel and I just put buffing wheels on it instead works just, just perfect. When, when you, when, when you, uh, go ahead, Tim. Oh, just as far as the, the buffing wheel, the motor, you want to stick to about 1750 RPMs. That's, that's about, you don't really want to go any higher than that. Because when they, when they sell these buffing uh, motors, they come in like 1750 and then like a, a 3400 version. The 3400 version is just going to burn through your stem. So you want to, you know, you want to think about something that's fast enough to do the job but not so fast that it's going to totally wear away your stem. So think about, you know, like 1750 or like David said, you know, variable speed motor so that you can control that. I just use a drill. Yeah, I the the um, the grinding wheel I got is is twenty five hundred, but I put a step down a switch on it, and so it it's um, we're not actually spinning that fast. And, and um, actually, both at seven fifty. Oh, right. You know, then then I then I back off. So David, after each bowl, for me, after I knock the bowl out of ash, I'll also clean out anything that might still be left in there. You know what I mean with a pick, and then. Uh, run the pipe cleaner both ways through the stem if it'll fit. And then uh, I'll usually fold the stem in half and then stick it down in there and fold the edges over and run that around inside the bowl to get ash out of there. That's it. So I'll have a really weird looking uh, ashtray of uh, wing gull pipe cleaners. <laughs> yeah. Todd, can I ask you how exactly you go, go about sweetening your pipes? I've never done that. You know, I just um, uh, take a smooth pipe cleaner, not the bristled one, um, just dip it in a, you know, I pour a half ounce of whiskey, uh, ardent spirit, um, and then just run it in through the mortise into the, into the stem. Okay. I'm going to pick up one of the little shooter bottles or something that I like and try that on my pipes. You know, but all of my clays are pretty low maintenance, and we were talking with Russ last week, and I'd, I, that's something I picked up. You know, if 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 uh, if any of my clays ever get ghosted, throw it on the throw it on the Barbie, throw it on the grill. That's cool. You guys, I hear some people indirect. putting those on the, on the, I mean, in the oven to clean to clean as well, but they have to be careful how long, because they can get burned. Mm-hmm. On the stand with clay pipes, which are a bit fragile, they used to fry them in the fire first. That's how, what I understand. They threw them in the fire and then dug them out, and it somehow made them a bit tougher. Of course, a lot of um, a lot of them got dodgy lips because they used to smash the end off, so they were short when they were doing mining and that. So you could stick it in your mouth. But of course, when it's rough, it would cut their lip, and they often got trouble with that. That's why they put wax on the end now, I think. You guys recall one of the first um, guest speakers we had was um, the um, the artful codger. Remember uh, we, we had him on. He's a terrific guy. I love him. Um, we're gonna try to have him back on again. But he watching one of his videos. We talk about pipe sweeteners. Okay. It's something that I started using, and you know, I swear by it. And, I think it's probably more common that people use something like what Todd's got, some some you know whiskey or something like that. Um, I use mouthwash. Seriously. Uh, <laughs> but when you think about it, it's like like what are you sweetening and why are you sweetening? It's like in the stem and in the mortise, you've got saliva and you've got ash and, and whatnot. And and that's basically day old ashtray 
that you've got sitting in your pipe there. And you know what that smells like. So I, um, uh, I said, well, so what would I do if, if I woke up and, and smelled like that? Well, I, you know, I'd rinse my mouth out. I'd brush my teeth, but whatever like that. And it, essentially it's the same thing. It, it has a, it has a very mild flavor. It's, you got to get the one that's made with alcohol. Not the, they have some now that don't have any alcohol in it, but that won't clean as well. And I run that down through the pipe just like everybody else does. And I, I make sure I give a little bit of a residue on the, the lip, on the mouthpiece. And the next time I come back to the pipe, it's got, you know, just like a little bit of chewing gum kind of flavor on it. It's like, oh, that's a great way to start smoking. <laughs> Again, I acknowledge my own weirdness, but there you go. That's a... Uh, I use, yeah. I use mouthwash too. <laughs> Peter's mouthwash. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's just a nice morning sipper if you're having a bad day. <laughs> so it says caution, extremely flammable right on the label. That's amazing. It's like a beverage. Do you see that? Peter, how is it that you get Everclear out there and you can't get mellow corn? I can't figure it out. I wanted to mention that. It's like, how the hell do I get this? But I can't get Evercorn or mellow corn. I ever corn that'd be a new product yeah uh, i i actually never tasted this but now i'm thinking i'm gonna put a little bit in a glass and just, i gotta taste this stuff <laughs> never had it do we have do we have a 911 number for peter <laughs> i'll wait, I'll wait until after the meeting <laughs> yeah. well, I, can't, I can't keep these things full uh i, I keep emptying them and, and by the way peter that that bottle was twelve dollars Wow. You know, that isn't as bad as you'd think. I mean, it's, <laughs> if you want to get drunk, that's a good well, <laughs> way to go. With that. <laughs> really but, strong. As that long was, as we're on the topic, I don't know, I don't know, how, many, I don't know how many people saw it. Uh, I put a recipe up there for um, the perfect um, Bloody Mary. Ah. And I added my Anthony Bourdain twist to it. And this was a first. I took two grams of McClellan Pure Perique. I wrapped it up in some cheesecloth and I let it marinate for six hours in my concoction. And I tried it out last night for the first time. And on second, I, what I should have done is just done the Perique in just the vodka, just the neutral spirit. So, but I, I, you know, I just uh, went for it. So, by the way, that one jar yielded six ounces of, of, of vodka. And it was delicious. It, it, the Perique added a, and I haven't even been able to put my finger on it, but it definitely infused into the vodka. And Russ was talking about the nicotine content and how Perique delivers it differently. Uh, it's not the heaviest in nicotine, but there's a property, and I, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but there's a property in the Perique that delivers the nicotine in such a way that it has a bigger oomph. Changes, so I had- Change the acidity in your mouth. I had, I, I, I had, okay, so I, I had three Bloody Marys. And it, rem it, that nicotine jumped up and kicked my ass. I mean, it, I, I think about the first time I smoked Peterson's Irish Flake when I first started, it was one of the first tobaccos I smoked. And it, the experienced pipe smoker, you know, give it to me. And I, I smoked it and that nicotine jumped up and blew my head off. And I had the same experience, man. It put me down on the couch. I was horizontal for a couple of hours. It was um, interesting. <laughs> My do, you, do you have pipe smoking competitions over in, in the colonies? Because we, we have them over here. And I remember once they always use a strong tobacco. And that really, that really did me. In. I don't know if you're familiar with smoking competitions. But, but, but oh, yeah, not but as we do. We used we to have them all the time. Yeah, we did a slow smoke at the pipe club. My very first meeting at the pipe club was a slow smoke contest. I didn't even get out of the box. I couldn't get the stupid thing to light. They give you two matches and then you're done. And I was, well, I am still learning, but then I was really still learning. You know what was odd? I, and I, I, I looked for that online 
pipe smoking contests. And I always heard about slow smoking pipe contests. Maybe I'll post the link. I'll have to go and find it. It was the most bizarre thing. I found it on YouTube. They had a pipe smoking contest in Britain on the fastest. Yeah. And you had like 30 guys up there choofing yeah. on these pipes <laughs> as fast as they freaking could. And I was like, what the hell's the point? What are they doing? You know, what's Missouri their cover? Meerschaum. Missouri Meerschaum did that last year for their anniversary. They had a they had a contest out there. And I think they used corn cobs too. And boy, <laughs> buddy of mine came in second place and couldn't smoke for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> My wife what? thought it was the funniest thing she'd ever seen. A load of blokes sitting there just concentrating on smoking. Because you basically you get five minutes to fill with a pipe. You all get the same pipe. You get five minutes to fill it. You get a wooden tamper and you get two matches. And you get one, I think, two minutes to light it. But you wait a minute because you don't want to be ahead of the game. <laughs> and you get a card. And they can go around and say, make smoke to make sure you ain't cheating. And what you do is you turn your card over when you've gone out. And the best I did was an hour and five minutes. But unfortunately, I came fourth and there are only three prizes. The first prize was a holiday in Japan. So, you know, it's taken pretty seriously sometimes, you know. I uh, respect everybody's um, everybody who likes to do those things. Uh, we do. My pipe club goes and visits the New York Pipe Club once a year. And we, they have a slow smoke contest. I have to say, I'm just not a fan because, you know, you start off with a brand new unbroken in pipe and then you get some type of tobacco and maybe it's good, and maybe it's not. And the whole object is to really keep the thing going for an hour so you can't take a break. So here you got a brand new pipe unbroken in and I don't know, just, I never really enjoyed it. I'm just not a fan, but I respect anybody who, who can do it. And the guy at the, at the New York pipe show has gone as much as an hour and a half or an hour and 45 minutes. He's won it several years in a row. So, you know, certainly, you know, kudos to him. You know, I'm not our, a fan. Our, our meeting last week with Russ, I, I was, I christened my, um, uh, my, my one and only stack uh, that ask with, and uh, I think I made it go like an hour and 45 minutes. I was, it was my own personal pipe smoking contest. Tried to make it go the whole meeting. <laughs> I participated we had, we had in one a of slow it. smoking contest twice uh, in at the uh, K Woody event. Yeah, that's the K Woody like, event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, my first time, I did uh, like a little over twenty minutes, uh, and second time, uh, and uh, actually uh, at, the, at that time, the record was uh, like about hour and forty-five minutes. Guys smoked for hour and forty-five. Oh, yeah. And my second time, I did about uh, like 37 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, in that uh, uh, that time, the record was just under an hour. So my second time, I did pretty well. <laughs> Dimitri, how many how many years have you been going to K Woody? Because I've been going for about the past 12 years. Yeah, uh, I've been there only twice. Oh, okay. Uh, in uh, 2019 and 2018. Well then, then were were you at the new place at the gun the gun club? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's well, you know what's yeah. interesting. You know what's interesting, Dimitri. You and I were in the same room together, but somehow never met. I don't know how that happened, but hey, if you go, if you go this year, I'll probably be there. <laughs> yes, if uh, event is happening, I'm planning to go. But Good. Uh, so I don't know if it's happening or not. <laughs> Patrick, have you ever done a slow smoke competition? Oh yeah, I was at uh, K Woody when they had it back in the old factory, the old K Woody factory, back in uh, I think it was uh, 2016, and I was also there last year with Dimitri at the new venue, the Gun Club, and I remember one year we did it. We had a tobacco that was bone dry, and I don't know how anybody kept it going for, for as long as it did. I think. Uh, Les Young from the Philadelphia Pipe Club won it that year, and he was he was smoking for an hour, and the tobacco was literally <laughs> sawdust. At the risk, at the risk of being controversial, um, is is introducing competition to pipe smoking not going to counter to the culture of just meeting up and having a smoke and chewing the fat? This Last year, I was participating in. In the one I have in my in my club here, 
we do it every September. And two years ago, even though I was probably doing it six or seven times, I was the last one with nine minutes. I was so embarrassed. I lost to a girl, to a guy from my pipe club who was puffing and puffing. And then I relighted out of the competition and I last another hour and 45 minutes. I'm like, how is that happening? And then last year on the contrary, I last like an hour and 13 minutes and it was another guy and me. And it's like, can you stop? Can you finish? Oh, I finish one of the two because this is boring. We don't talk to anybody. We are only concentrating in the pipe. I thought about trees, people passing by, like plans that I have to do, how to clean my house. I have to mow the lawn. It's like, let's finish. This is boring. It is a little boring. When we do it in our club, I mean, we're normally meeting for about, I don't know, two and a half hours or so. So, I mean, the competition doesn't take the whole time. So you can chat before that. And of course, when you go out, which <laughs> most of us do really, is just two or three are really good. And then you can sort of chat because, you know, they're so in their own world. They don't, they don't care what you're doing. They're just concentrating on keeping that thing alight. I mean, some Europeans do this weird thing where they don't actually smoke it. They just move the ashes around and that. And then that's a bit odd. So they get two and a half hours or something like that. But to me, if you ain't smoking it, that's what I would call a bit daft, personally. And I know because yeah. I've, I've, our blokes have been to the one in Germany and, and so on and so forth. So they have a sort of bizarre view on it. But, I mean, we have to actually smoke it. Like I say, they ask you to make, to make smoke. I mean... It, there's no doubt about it. It's one of the weirdest thing you've ever seen. I mean, we have a competition, every, a darts competition every year with a club called the Handlebar Club. Now, it ain't handlebars on motorbikes. It's handlebars moustaches. So you can imagine sort of two weird clubs, you know, the Pipe Club of London and the Handlebar Club playing darts with each other. It's, uh, it's been on the television a few times because it is, uh, to say the least... Uh, because, I mean, pipe smokers are often a little eccentric. Well, certainly the ones I know, or me, me myself, I guess. And, uh, you know, these blokes with handlebar moustaches that come out, you know, a foot either side of their face, for example, they're also a little odd. But, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's just a bit of fun, really. I mean, you know, got to, life's a bit, particularly at the moment, it's a bit, you know, you can imagine it's a bit horrible with all this uh, lockdown and that, which, uh, so, I mean... You know, when we come out of it, I'm sure the pipe club's going to get a hundred new members or something. I can, I can well imagine. We had a cheater. We had a cheater one year. We were all smoking corn cobs back then, and uh, he was. Uh, no, I think. Oh, you no, you're using your own pipe. I think, and he had a corn cob. And uh, after he won, we realized that he was scraping the cob. And smoking the cob, <laughs> so like, <laughs> that's when they switched to wooden tampers. <laughs> Everybody got the same wooden tamper. He he had a knife and he he put his hand over the bowl and then he scrape a little cob off and tap it down and smoke it. And so he was smoking smoking the corn cob. So we we caught on to that, but not after he already won. <laughs> I might be wrong, but I'm pretty certain that the Pipe Club of London is the oldest pipe club in the world, continuously running right from the beginning. It's certainly, I mean, we'll get a dozen people at a meeting or more. And we're lucky now because, of course, they ban smoking everywhere. But there's a pipe, they ban it anywhere near all sorts of things. But there is a pipe shop that isn't really near anything except for the uh, army. And um, so... They have a cigar room downstairs. So we're allowed to, to go there once a month and go downstairs and the cigar smokers don't mind. So we take over one whole corner and we just buy a bit from the shop because I think that the law says you've got to be sampling from the shop. So you've got to cover yourself a bit. And then, so that was good because for ages we couldn't find anywhere. I mean, we found places that you could do it outside. And in the winter, they had like a bit of a, warmth and they sort of half covered it because it, it just about obliged the law you know but it was a bit of a bad time when they decided to ban smoking i mean we're we're pretty unlucky unlu because in other countries i mean for example i play as as i mentioned earlier and most places i go like germany i'm in there 
backstage or or even on the dark on the floor and they just say and i say have you banned smoking and they say well sort of and the fire inspectors come round, and i'm sitting there smoking my pipe and they don't care and i mean places like denmark that they banned it but if a pub's small enough you're allowed to smoke in there so you just find a pub that only has 20 30 people and go in there so but unfortunately we've like really thoroughly banned it just about everyone i've heard all sorts of stories about parts of america where they even want to ban you smoking outside and all all sorts i don't know what you blokes think about that but it seems pretty harsh to me yeah <laughs> that smoking outside it really gets to me there is unfortunately a cultural war on all tobacco use <clears throat> and we just you know again i posted this um out in california they banned all flavored tobaccos, but they made an exception for pipe tobacco, uh, which is hmm. pretty cool. Hey, back down in Palm, pipe down in Palm Springs. What was that, Stephen? Yeah. Down in Palm Springs, they've got a golf course. You're allowed to smoke on two holes. <laughs> I don't play I went that to Australia course. and they banned <laughs> snuff. You can't take snuff in Australia, but they don't know what it is. So if you take it through customs, because I sometimes take some snuff and they don't know. So, but theoretically it's banned. I mean, what sort of thinking goes on? Because I mean, you can't get anything. I mean, how does snuff hurt anyone else? I mean, seriously, you know. Back to uh, pipe maintenance. Um, you can drink on the other uh, 16. Yeah, I guess. <clears throat> You're allowed to you're allowed to smoke on the you're allowed to smoke on the bowling green. Uh, most bowling greens in Scotland, you're still allowed to have a cigarette. Most of them smoke cigarettes, but there's the odd pipe smoker. Being a golf caddy was my very first job um, that I ever had. Um, well, other Me than too. other than um, than harvesting strawberries and whatnot in the summertime when I was in school, but um, almost all the the gentlemen that I caddied for. We're smoking cigars um, or pipes, by the way. It smoke uh, not that many cigarettes. It, it, hardly anybody smokes a cigarette. So, certainly nobody smoked a cigarette on the green or on the course at all. But they would smoke a cigar. They'd smoke a pipe on the on the course. I was caddying when I was 11 years old. And one of the guys I was caddying for, he was a cigarette smoker. And on the fifth hole, I'll never forget it. We're walking up the hill to the green and... <laughs> I think about John Daly. He, he just dropped dead right there. Oh, dropped dead? Yeah. Uh, I use, when I'm cleaning my pipes, I'll use these near up chamber brushes. Uh, they're really cool. They also, you know, I use the uh, conical bristle pipe cleaners, but near up always, they also have these um, brushes which are. Uh, they're good to run through before you run the bristle cleaner through because they take a lot of stuff out. But I was wondering about um, how you guys maintenance your vulcanite stems. I think I've got eight pipes that are vulcanite. I've only got one Peterson that's vulcanite, my first pipe, and I'm, all my Ashtons are vulcanite. My Tom Elk tang is a vulcanite. How do you deal with the oxidation issues? Well, I think I from my pipe club who normally what I do they just get, you know, like a Tupperware, okay, fill it there and fill it with a little bit of water and also like OxyClean, mix it, nothing complicated, and then drop um, all the stems for about maybe an hour or two. You can see how everything is pouring. And then when you get these ones, you can sand it or, or you can just get a cloth and clean them yeah. and they're yeah. perfectly. So what I'm, I'm doing is uh, I have a couple of uh, Peterson pipes with this uh, very soft uh, stems. And after I smoke it, I use this. This is a very cheap lip balm. So I put a little yeah. bit on the stem, let it sit there exactly. That's, that's perfect. So you, you don't have an issue later on with, uh, with oxidation. So it, it works very well. So when I'm at home, I use this. This is a uh, food grade mineral oil. Oh, it's right. perfect also for the bowl and, and for the stem. So, and uh, yeah, then I'm ready to go. It's very good. And it's cheap. 
I, I use the obsidian oil, which smells a lot to me like linseed oil. Yeah, this is odorless. So this is odorless and tasteless and colorless and it's food grade. So it's, it, it's pretty much perfect for that. Generally for the ones I'm worried about, I just keep them well buffed with a little bit of carnival wax. I hope I'm not going to shock anybody, but the old way of doing it is what I do. You stick it down the side of your nose where there's a bit of oil and you rub that in. And that was what my granddad told me. And that's what they used to do back in the day. And that's basically that's what I cool. do. Yeah, there's a brick and mortar in San Jose that I used to frequent. And one of the guys, he was an old guy, he said, oh, you just reach back behind your ear and grab some earwax and smear it on there, you know. <laughs> I was like, ah, uh, no thanks. But it's not tasteless. That's yeah. <laughs> of course, another way here in Kentucky, we do it with moonshine. It works all the time. On on, on vulcanite? I'm, I'm just messing. Okay, I was going to say, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't work. <laughs> Stay away from the thing. In the yeah, don't, no, don't do that. <laughs> I've you know, cleaned vulcanite, vulcanite before with those with those Mr. Clean scrubbing pads that you see advertised. Uh, just put a little little water on them; and just, it'll scrub the, a lot of the oxidation off. Uh, a, a lot of my pipes I've used beeswax, both for the bowl and for the stem itself, particularly the vulcanite stems, to put a coating on. The beeswax, of course, food grade stuff. I also have some food grade uh, oil, not too different from what Oliver's got that I use on cutting boards. And it also works. So I ha don't know if you guys remember this. This is, this is months ago that maybe our first, one of our first meetings, for, I think the first time Dimitri came to the meeting and he taught me something or, you know, or he, you know, he taught me, so he really did teach me something, but it, it reminded me of, of my old, you know, college days in chemistry class, you know, so he really brought it out as something that was like, oh, con dots connected that when you look at um, what, what we call oxidation, the discoloration, especially the, the yellow um, color on a pipe stem, what you're seeing is sulfur, right? So vulcanite is, um, is rubber, which is an organic material that is mixed with sulfur and then heated to a high temperature, which creates this you know, new kind of material, which we're calling vulcanite. And then under certain conditions, it begins to break apart. It begins to, you know, um, break back down into its components. And so you're seeing a layer or patches of emerging sulfur. And that's what gives it that sort of yellow, yellow color. And you, you can't put the egg back in the shell. You know, you, you just have to get rid of it and get back down to a layer where the vulcanite has not broken down yet. And it's black and shiny. But Dimitri, like... I don't know if I, I really handed it to you, but you really, like that was a lesson from you to me and I really appreciated that. It, it, it changed the way that I took care of my stems, just having yeah. that. Actually, uh, do you know how rubber actually was discovered? When they were bring, uh, bringing uh, latex uh, from South America to Europe, they used uh, powdered sulfur to prevent uh, those uh, sheets of uh, latex uh, from sticking to each other. And one time uh, there was a fire on the ship, so that latex uh, caught on fire and they tried to extinguish it, like to uh, basically uh, like putting pressure on it, covering it and uh, starting uh, uh, like uh, mashing it uh, together, those uh, sheets of uh, hot latex with sulfur. And they discovered that uh, in the result, they got material which is not as sticky as pure latex. It's much more durable. And that's basically what rubber is, uh, polymer of latex and sulfur. And if you, get, uh, if you put more sulfur in there, you get vulcanite, which is uh, basically a rubber with a higher sulfur content. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not a clincher for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is um, when I first started this hobby and I, I wasn't, I hadn't established, you know, my own technique for holding the pipe. 
I, I, I tried clinching. I thought it was natural to clinch. And I was on, um, I was on the Golden Gate Bridge with my pipe in mouth. It was a paneled ebony. It was a pipe of the year, actually. It was Peterson. And in a moment of inattention, uh, that pipe went over the edge into the potato patch, 225 feet below. The other time I was clinching, uh, I was in an, the men's room uh, and in the process of buttoning my pants, um, in went the pipe to the toilet. Can't salvage that. But the other, the other one is um, the, the teeth marks in the vulcanite. Uh, and I, I, I had uh, one pipe, well, my very first pipe, the Peterson, which is a P-lip, which, you know, that, why would you clinch a P-lip? But um, I've got a couple of teeth marks in there. And it, it, it just, um, yeah, not a, and I do not, it's hard to clinch a clay. Yeah, the clays always remind me to, to back off even a little bit of clenching that I do do because I always feel, I don't know about you, Todd, but I always feel like it's going to crack. Any oh, second. Are we now. here? Am I gone? You're there. You're there. I don't know where you went. You froze. Um, so, about what other kinds of um, special tools? So Todd brought out the, the bristle brush. Uh, anybody else have uh, something special that they use for, for their cleaning? Dave, Dave, to so see, do you have a special kind of uh, tool that you use for for cleaning? You mean me? Or yeah. the other David. I was talking about Dave, Dave Susi up, up there in the corner. Um, I normally don't, I'm lucky because we have a guy here who fix our pipes. So sometimes you get five or 10 dirty, you just give it to him and for like, like maybe 20, 20 bucks, he cleans all these ones for you and buffers and get rid of everything. I normally do that with the state pipes. So I really don't do much uh, other than every now and then I just get a, a, any alcohol get the pipe cleaners, keep cleaning, cleaning, cleaning the stem and the bowl until it goes clean. Um, normally I tend to rotate my pipes a lot, so I barely build any cake and I'm careful with the rim, not burning it. And all pipes that I have, like a vulcanite ones, yes, sometimes I do that and I just give it to him and clean. Or I just do it myself What I told you with the OxyClean, again, putting it in the bowl, put some water, the OxyClean, you just leave it there a couple hours and the whole thing cleans by itself. You don't have to do much. And then you buffer it at the end or, or just get a, a clean cloth until it's gone. Yeah, and I just want to add one more thing. Uh, when there is uh, some uh, tar build up on the rim of the pipe, uh, well, um, when I uh, see uh, it starts accumulated on the rim of the pipe, first thing, a little bit of saliva on a paper towel and uh, moisten it uh, with the saliva, let it sit for a few seconds and then wipe it with a dry paper towel. If uh, that buildup is getting uh, too big, uh, too heavy, uh, put a drop of uh, olive oil or any other like food grade vegetable oil, let it sit there for a minute or two and then wipe it uh, with a soft cloth or paper towel. And that usually takes care of that. I got the same thing that Dimitri is saying about like, I tend to get my saliva all the time, every time I light it or something. It's kind of like a tick that I do it every day. So I don't have a problem. And normally I don't keep, I don't keep my lighter on top all the time. If I'm not like puffing, I just put it away. So. I don't really have problems like having to clean my pipes. So I'm curious now about how um, many of you guys learned some of these techniques from a pipe mentor, your dad, your grandpa, or did you just pick it up on, you know, YouTube? Okay. Technically, technically, I had a mentor from the pipe club. Mm -hmm. uh, I. Uh, I picked up the pipe for a year or two in the mid nineties and an old Navy buddy of mine taught me every little bit that I knew then. 
then I put it down. Um, it was just too busy, and I'm one of those who I smoke a pipe so I can sit and enjoy it. I don't smoke it when I'm working. I don't smoke. The only other thing I do when I'm smoking a pipe is talk to you guys. <laughs> Uh, or when the or when the brick and mortar pipe club meeting can uh, meet, I talk to them. Um, but the the pipe club meetings I was going to here in Arizona is where I learned most of what I know now. There is one more thing that you do, Terry, when you're smoking a pipe, and and that's tell your wife, "Yes, dear." <laughs> you, you've seen me do that. <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, it's a miracle that I even stuck with it because I didn't have anybody, uh, didn't know anything. It was a steep and arduous, painful learning curve. Um, and there was even a time when, you know, after a couple of years and I thought I knew what I was doing and I came to realize I really had no idea what I was doing, you know, with regard to packing the bowl or cadence and rhythm and sipping and all the rest of it. And this, this, this club is fantastic uh, uh, because, you know, I used to spend a lot of time on tobacco reviews um, and I'm, I'm never on there anymore. You know, I mean, I, I, I was grasping, trying to glean every insight that I possibly could from reading reviews and, you know, checking out smokingpipes.com and seeing what they're posting. And, you know, this is great. You know, you have a wealth of knowledge, a thousand years of pipe smoking here. It's fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've definitely learned a lot. I, every week I learn something. Uh, and not only from our guest speakers, but you know, pick up little things from everybody who comes to the club. That's, you know, one of the, why it's one of my favorite things to do over the, over the whole week is hang out with you guys. Another thing I can share with you guys is that, um, and this is one of the things I learned from um, an elder member of my pipe club. After you smoke maybe a couple bowls today, I tend to leave the bottom full of like all the ashes for the reason that they say that these ashes kind of gain all your saliva and all the sweat that it happens there. So if you leave it a couple extra hours, it kind of gets everything and makes you clean with a pipe cleaner after that. Some people do it, some people don't. It works for me. Then do you knock it next time you smoke? Yes, I always, no, I mean, let's say I leave it for about an hour or two, then I clean it right away. But if you leave it an extra hour, all these acids get as much uh, liquid and saliva, humidity, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever is at the bottom of the bowl. And then when you use the pipe cleaner, maybe an hour later, it's easier to clean. David, I think uh, starting out, I was kind of in the same boat that uh, Todd was as just a one person, you know, smoking a pipe and didn't really have anybody family wise or whatever. But uh, so for me, YouTube was the place that YouTube pipe community and, you know, matches and mutton chop and uh, the Dagners and, you know, all those kind of people and seeing what they did. And of course, you know, expanding, you know, the people that you ch channeled with. And, but I tell you, once I found out about the San Diego pipe club and started going to those meetings where you sit down with other pipers and a uh, and meeting, Thing, you learn so much so fast and that's what's great about you know the zoom environment too because you kind of do the same thing you can see you know the person showing you what it is that they do or what they have and how they do it and have a conversation you know kind of thing and uh, that helps so much with the learning about uh, this uh, avocation or hobby you know, just as, just as one example as a result of being in this you know um, I've got I've got a lifetime worth of tobacco. I don't need any more. I've got about 80 different blends. Um, and they talked about revelation, what Einstein smoked last week with Russ. And that there's a, a, a match for that, uh, Cornell and Deal Epiphany. And I, you know, I went to visit, I was on my way to uh, go to a friend's wedding in, in, in Manhattan. And I stopped off to visit a former student of mine at Princeton and uh, she was giving me a little walkabout and we were walking 112 Mercer Street. Oh, that's Albert Einstein's old house. And I was like, whoa. And that was before I started smoking pipes. And then Walter Isaacson came out with uh, uh, Einstein's biography, 
unbelievable. I'm not a hard science guy. I'm a soft science guy. I, you know, I'm, I lack the quantitative reasoning skills, but the pipe figured so he was a violinist. He was a pipe smoker. And, um, so yeah, I got the, uh, I got the epiphany and, um, I also got, uh, what was, Oh, Oh, haunted, haunted bookshop because of your review, David. And that, that package is going to come in the mail. My wife's going to say, really, honey, <laughs> are you serious? See, so they call you honey only if it's somber. I got to tell you guys, I must be lucky. My wife not only accepts my pipe smoking, she encourages me to go get new stuff when we have the money. Mine encourages me to go outside. <laughs> I am outside. I've got my, my smoking den here in the heat. No, she's great because she, she lets me do it. She knows that on Friday night, before my Saturday morning ritual, I like to come out here and get a little tight. Uh, and, you know, Tata's going to go out back and tie one on and smoke a few bowls. And, and then I'm going to get up in the morning and, and, and do the club. It's, um, it's great. Speaking of, it. speaking of Haunted Bookshop, um, a buddy of mine, well, well this is the, uh, the matches 860, uh, Friday Savinelli, the, uh, the tribute pipe that uh, Eddie Gray from the Pipe Nook um, got in contact with Savinelli and, and they cr created in um, John Harden's memory. And I just got it this week. I haven't smoked it yet. It's brand new. I'm waiting because my uh, college uh, buddy, he's my, my uh, pipe smoking buddy and he got one too. We're going to, we're going to light it up together, but I just received this uh, this week. That's so nice. That's a really it's nice fun. pipe. Yeah. Beautiful. Smoke I don't have great. a Savinelli yet. John, did that did that matches uh, that matches uh, eight sixty? Uh, was that the pipe shape that he liked to smoke? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, I think it's the six. Is it the six forty three or something? No, like seventy three. Seventy three. Yeah, and mine, mine's numbered. They're all numbered. Um, he actually, Eddie Gray actually got eight hundred and commissioned eight hundred and sixty pipes. Mine's numbered 844 of the, of the six, 860. Um, so one of these days I'll get to it when my, my buddy and I can get together and light it up together. And we'll be smoking Haunted Bookshop in it. Tim, he would uh, hold the pipe up and say, smoking the Friday 7 Ellie. And that would be the pipe you would have. Yeah. So that's how it came about. And it was a lot of his videos. That's where. And you also have to see it sideways like he used to do. I love that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody saw it. Um, Janos Kikinos posted a, a, a picture of a pipe that he made. And I, I saw that and I made a snap impulse purchase right now. Bang. It is the most stunning piece of briar bird's eye I had ever seen. So that's in the mail and I'm, I'm waiting to get that. Um, yeah, I have no business buying any more pipes, but it's, you know, with pipes, you know, I look at pipes all the time at smokingpipes.com and, or wherever. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I can't buy that. You know, that's a nice pipe. You know, I can't buy that. But then something like what Janos posted, I'm like, ah, I got to have that. I got to have that. And I was, I was lucky to, to snap it up. Do you have a good lawyer? <laughs> uh, I, I don't. <laughs> you might want to look into it. I'm not making the connection. Oh, a divorce lawyer, you mean? Oh, yeah, that, that would work, yeah. I think that I'm um, stumbling into the pipe world um, on Facebook or whatever. It has been a big um, eye-opener to me in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, when Tom Elting was on, uh, was our guest, you know, his point of view was very much like, I'm a craftsman, I'm not an artist. And, you know, like, I respect his point of view. I would call him an artist, right? I mean, he makes art. One of the things that's so incredible about the, the pipe world is how many artists there are right now. You know, I look on, you know, like Todd, you know, I, I see some of these pipes and I'm like, I, if I just let myself get carried away, I'd have a, a thousand pipes and I'd be single. But um, 
but they're it because they're so beautiful. There's there's so much creativity, so much expression in, in, in those pipes. Um, we started, and John would John started off talking about plateau, and this is the uh, Kareem Abdul. Yeah. That plateau. This is such. So, I'm not even. I don't want to even put a match to this. It's just a stunning, beautiful piece of art. Kareem does wonderful work with plateaus. Like that's his fort, his plateau, I think. And and Tom Eltang, I I I I think he's an engineer because this pipe, this little tiny thing, is the most. It's a smoking machine. I it, it's. It is an, I don't know the, I'm, like I said, I'm not a hard science guy. I don't understand how this little piece of wood uh, smokes so much better and more efficiently than any other variety I have. It's amazing. Functional art. Well, in my opinion, any skilled craftsman in any field is an artist. We used Speaking to, the Pipe Club in London, we used to go to a pipe maker. He's died now, unfortunately. And we used to, he used to let us make a pipe. And I remember on one occasion, you picked your own piece of wood. One of our blokes, just by unbelievable luck and randomness, picked a straight grain. And you should, <laughs> this poor bloke, you know, this is, <laughs> he's basically polished it himself and realized that, of course, you know, the deal was that you made the pipe. And you kept it, so there you go. And that was, uh, to say the least, a bit of luck. Although I, th I think he said, "Look, I really feel like I ought to pay you something for this," but he was, you know, he just said, "No, no, no problem," and that was that. But I'm sure that hurt somehow because I mean, you know, those things go for a lot of, lot of dosh, as far as I know. I meant to change the topic for a minute. I know we're about to end. Um, Samberg, John, and me, we were talking, I believe, Wednesday or Thursday, and I know he posted on the on the page about maybe the possibility of perhaps expanding this conversation for people who can stay, and I know you and Oliver um, posted and talking, so what do you guys think about that? So let me, Oliver's got some more uh, to put input on, on that, but uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I came up with just from a technical perspective point of view. And it's very similar to some of the stuff that I do with the other groups that I lead on Zoom. So A, number one, perfectly, perfectly easy to extend this beyond the two hours when I'm sitting here hosting. Like if anybody comes in late or they want to hang out more or is like, you know, I got nothing to do. So I'm going to, I'd like to, you know, all I have to do is, is pass the hosting or co-hosting on to whoever wants to stay. And then when you guys are done, just like lock the door behind you. That's all, there. it's just that easy. Um, as far as um, other times, like th this is actually quite an interesting idea to have the club, have club members, you know, sort of randomly say, anybody out there who wants to come and hang out, I'm, I'm lighting up a bowl and I'd like to have somebody to chat with, use your own Zoom um, account to, to host a meeting but you can post it on the group page, right? So we just make a post and uh, put it up there. What I would recommend is that you always date and timestamp it in because people will come back later and go, did I miss it? Is it now? Or is it? So, you know, say it's Tuesday and it's 4 p.m. Eastern and I'm smoking, who's up for it? You know, um, and then uh, these are kind of very interesting little ad hoc kind of meetings. So those are the, the two things that uh, when when Oliver brought it to my attention, I thought of right away, and I'm I'm happy to do that. Let's start next week. Don't mind, but I'll I'll uh, um, anybody when we get to the end here who wants to hang out more, I'll just pass over the uh, co-host to you. It's a I think it's a great idea, David. It's a great Oliver, idea. Yeah, more that um, you were you were thinking of too. I, I think you had a couple other ideas as well. We have a line on Ernie Q. Yet? Um. No, I haven't. I haven't spoken to him yet. But but I could. You mean a line on him coming and talking to us? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I haven't done that yet, but that's something I could do if you guys would be interested in that. Absolutely. I would love to pick that guy's brain. And Brian Levine, he's due for Disney when? Uh, on the 29th of September, I believe. Oh, wow. uh, you know, okay. of September. It's going to be coming. So as long as we're on the topic, uh, next week we um, don't have anybody scheduled as a guest speaker yet. We may have a continuation of uh, you know, how to take care of pipes or how to destroy pipes. <laughs> Maybe talk about your, your, your burnouts and all that kind of uh, um, terrible tales. Um, and then the week after that, we have Chris Morgan um, will be our guest speaker and bring some bones and talk about that uh, with us. So really looking forward to, to him being our guest. One thing I can do if you guys want, I mean, he's not famous. I was thinking, I already talked to Jim, the guy who cleans Furby's pipes from my pipe club. Maybe one day that we don't have a topic based on the topic today. Maybe we can go to his house and he can show us in his basement how he fixed a couple pipes and just to try. Maybe you guys can see and ask questions while he's doing everything or hey, David, any time. Um, this week and see if he's, again, he'd like to join. Yeah. That, that was that. a continuation of today's conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a, some people over here on, on YouTube as well. I want to make sure that they know that they're not being forgotten um who have um uh, other suggestions people in their town so wkr piper in cincinnati has got some local people in cincinnati maybe we could bring in you know, so it doesn't matter at all whether we've covered a topic or whether we have you know 14 pipe restores or or whatever everybody's got something special to share and so i, I love to have them and your your recommendations are remember this is not my pipe club it's your pipe club we can bring in anybody and everybody that you guys are interested in on that note let me say we've still got we got 10 minutes to chat and then i'm gonna you know boost everybody out just so that we make sure that uh everybody gets back in touch with their family next weekend um we'll start up anybody who wants to stay after the two hour welcome to stay and um, I'll just leave the, the room running and pass over the co-host to David or whoever else wants to hang out. Then when you're done, you just click end meeting and the doors close. So um, as, a, as a sort of a, a, a wrap up to this conference, first of all, thank you, all you guys. Pretty interesting stuff here. I'm gonna have to get myself some, some mellow corn because I've never heard of that before. So. That's that's coming my way. <laughs> um, any, twelve bucks a bottle. Twelve bucks a bottle. <laughs> I'm, I'll stock up. It'll sit in my garage along with the toilet paper and paper towels that I stocked up on. Um, any bad habits with pipes that you're like, oh, that was a lesson learned, and I should remember not to do that again. Any any horror stories you want to share? I got one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my one of my pipe uh, guys, his father, he passed all the pipes to him, and one time he received a downhill from a friend in England. And he's the kind of guy who hit it against his like the sole of his foot or his <laughs> shoe, against the like chimney, you name it. And one time he cracked the shank just because of that, oh, and his oh. son was like, "Dad, what have you done? One pipe, I, you get like a downhill that I can inherit." And you just broke it. I don't care. I just smoke my Prince Albert. That's it. <laughs> you know, when I lost that paneled ebony pipe of the year, the moment it fell out of my mouth, and I watched it go all the way down to the water, I think of Marlon Brando, the horror. The horror. <laughs> A real sense of loss. It's brand at new. least you didn't jump. Yeah, I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing, um, this is not a story, uh, another benefit of 
being a part of this pipe club and being a part of the, um, the overall online pipe community is is discovering what I what I like about pipes. You know, as a not a forty year pipe smoker or with pipe smokers in my family to, to come across, you know, I go through a discovery process of the styles and the shapes and the and one of the things that that I had no idea that I would that I would like is, is rusticated versus smooth pipes. And I, I just found out about myself how much I like rusticated pipes. And um, I've got plenty of both, but uh, and then on even more specifically are old Jobies. So I just I just picked up this one. I've got about three or four others that are similarly rusticated. And they just, you know, I, I found it through a Facebook group, Michael Curcio, who does a lot of pipe restorations. Every Monday night, he posts a bunch of pipes that he's cleaned up. And so I, I found this one and, and I picked it up. I never would have known had I not been for essentially you guys um, uh, to uh, sort of discover something about myself. I have no idea why. It just, it just, you know. You know, that's funny because when I started smoke, when I first started, I, I was I, I was only going for the smooth finish. I wanted the I wanted the flame grain. I wanted the uh, I, I wanted the bird's eye. And um, and then, I, you know, uh, I can't even remember how it happened. I, it, uh, but I. Virtually everything I buy now, with the exception of this recent Kareem and the birds I had just bought from um, Janos, uh, rusticated, man. My Ashtons are beautiful rustications. And when you think about, well, it's a sandblast, right? So they sandblast that thing and it just a stunning reveal of the briar. We were talking about, you know, artistry and uh, some people are better sandblasters than others. And it, I, I just love the feel in the hand and uh, being able to see, you know, the grain up close like that. So I went from going to smooth to the rusticated. I, I've got six Briarworks bull moose, the C 111s, uh, and they use the wire rustication on that. Those are fantastic, and they're only like a uh, hundred bucks. Uh, I love those things. I, in fact, I was one of these right here. There it is. Oh, I can't Let's see if I can get that. It's got that wire. I don't have any other pipes like that. I, I think it's the only one. Love it. Great, great feel in the hand, grip. Well, I might be teaching granny to suck eggs here, but as I understand it, the idea is that you get a larger surface area, so you get a cooler smoke. I think that's the idea of rustification. David, you might want to take a look at um, some of the old Caminettos that were made by a Radice and a Scordi. So you can get them on eBay on a, like a estate pipes and they have a, a similar, very deep, craggy rustication like that Joby you just saw. I think you'd really like that finish. Let me go check those out. I, I, I seem to recall that I've seen some Radice's like that I liked the look of as well. Yeah. Yeah, this but this was this was the uh, line that they did back in the '70s. That when they they were working together before they went their own separate way, it was it's called the Caminetto, and I think the Tinderbox used to carry them. But um, you know, really nice, great smoking pipe. I I lit up some Sun Bear in my uh, Caminetto the other day, and it was like amazing. So uh, yeah, really cool pipe. Fantastic. Tim, right. how many pipes do you have? I'm sorry. How many pipes do you have in your collection? Oh, I don't know. It's probably about 150 ish or so, but I've been doing this for 30, 40 years. So, you know, it's been, it's been a lot of, uh, you know, accumulating over the years. You ever call your pipe collection, uh, Tim? I'm sorry? You ever call your pipe collection? Like, like, okay, I'm just getting rid of all these and then start over. Yeah. I mean, I, some of them, like right now I'm trying to, I've been, as you guys know, I've, kind of gotten into this Peterson thing. So some of the pipes that I, you know, I, I, they're very nice pipes and, you know, certainly I bought them for a reason, but you know, over the years, it's not that I don't like them. I just, 
you know, I want to take some that I don't smoke very frequently and trade them or sell them and, you know, use that cash to try to, you know, add to the Peterson collection. And I mean, the other pipes that I really, I'm interested in, I'm really interested in Il Seppo. I think it's a really underrated Italian pipe and they're, they're beautiful and they smoke really well. So I'm just trying to shift my collection a little bit, just like kind of, you know, redefine it. I, I, I'd say my collection, it's very eclectic. I mean, I've got a lot of different things. You know, I do focus on the Peterson now, but, you know, I like all kinds of pipes, but so that's basically what I'm doing. I just do a little shifting. I know a lot of guys do that too. They get, you know, get tired of pipes. So let me get something new. You know, we were talking about maintenance of the pipes. And one of the things that was very revealing to me early on is that when I first started, I did not understand the thermodynamics dynamics involved in smoking a pipe. I mean, you've got a piece of wood and you're putting some dried vegetation in and you're, you're lighting it on fire. Um, and as soon as you apply that heat, uh, you get thermal expansion. That's why you never adjust your stem because the most vulnerable part of the pipe is the uh, mortise, which will snap off. Uh, and the pipe, the wood expands which is why you have to let the pipe rest and cool and contract back to its original size. Um, yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's funny that, and I had that one burnout in that Dunhill that I bought, that $800 Dunhill. I don't know, how many of you guys have had pipe burnouts? Never. That's what I I'm said saying. One. You had one, Dennis? Uh, I had uh, one uh, burnout. Actually, that was the first pipe I ever smoked. I got it uh, for free from my, uh, from my landlady. And I knew nothing about pipe smoking, so I was really abusing that pipe. And finally, I got the burnout. Well, and that's that's why it was such a weird situation because I, I bought that Dunhill. I was very careful with it. I knew about cadence and I knew that it wasn't uh, uh, the the uh, interior wasn't pre-carbonized. So I was being as cool as I could with it. And son of a gun, I woke up again, the horror. And it, there was this big cavity in the side of the bowl. And I'm like, holy crap. And of course, when I call smoking pipes and I'm saying, hey, man, guys, and they're like, you idiot, what'd you do? You know, you don't know what you're doing. So that was why I, you know, I'm telling them, listen, I know what I'm doing and it must have been a defect. There must have been, you know, a piece of sand or something in there that allowed that to do it that way. I was lucky they credited me. No cap. Um, I think this is a, a great place to segue um, into uh, the rest of the afternoon for everybody, but let's, Bring that story, I'm sure, back at the next weekend and maybe talk about more horror stories and things that, um, cautionary tales. Well, one of the things that I, I think that um, you guys might not know, and, and because you've been in the club meeting, you don't need to watch it again, but we do have all the live streams and the recordings on the YouTube channel. And we do get quite a few people who are watching them afterwards and, and making comments about how much they're enjoying of sort of vicariously being a part of the club meeting and learning um, from everybody who's here to, to share. And so there are new pipe smokers who are watching us and learning from your experiences. Sometimes they turn into, like I say, a cautionary tale. You know, don't, don't smoke too heavily or careful about how you pack it and whatnot. So let's bring that back next week. What do you think? Talk about then. So um, again, for those of you guys over there on YouTube, I, I turn my head because this is where my monitor is. Uh, my YouTube's always to the west or something. But um, I uh, uh, want to say thank you for joining us. The, the YouTube group who is watching us live is growing week by week. We, we match at least as many people on YouTube live as we have live in the uh, Zoom room. And so that's really cool. Just think of however many people you see showing up in the Zoom room. We got twice as many people actually attending. That's really cool. Um, so uh, at this this week, we're going to end here. But next week, it might go on. 
I go on and on. Um, and so let me say thank you. You be well. I want to welcome all the new guys, Ian, and uh, let me see who else uh, I was there. Um, uh, John uh, is here. John is nice to, to see you. Alice, the second week in a row, and we didn't scare you away the first week. That was. Uh, we'll do our. We'll do better next time. We'll. <laughs> hey, great meeting. Good seeing you guys, man. Yeah. Good seeing you guys. And I know right. that Dave and, and myself is probably oh. um, talk talk a lot. But don't don't imagine for a second that we're trying to dominate the conversation. Y'all can jump in anytime and say whatever you got on your mind. Um, Phil, this my fellow Scotsman by our distant relation. Always good to see you, brother. I miss you when you're not here. One third of the founding fathers were Scotsmen, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you, Phil, for the uh, sound bear. Rebellious nation. <laughs> well, oh, sorry. That's our thing. Yeah. So be well, be safe, wash your hands, take care, and I'll see you guys next week. All right. Cheers, guys. <laughs>